the, the uh, miracles of modern technology and what I have to travel with nowadays instead of just yeah. a pen and a piece of paper. But it's not um, bad, actually. Okay, so this should be pretty painless, I hope. And uh, All right. Um, yeah, maybe 15 questions. 15 questions, all right. Sounds all like right. the final I'm making up for the moment. So I'll start with my favorite. Uh, what, what did you want to be when, or where did you grow up, I guess I should start with? Grew up in Philadelphia, okay. Pennsylvania, until I was in my... I guess mid twenties or so. And growing up, what did you want to be? Oh, what did I want to be? Well, I started out. Um, I mean, aside from the usual childhood things of cowboy, fireman, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. I started out. Um, my first interests were in science. I thought astronomy. I wanted to be an astronomer, and that lasted through the middle of high school when I got involved with the uh, with the drama club there, and then I became interested in the theater. I think as much because I went to an all-boys school, and there was an all-girls school down the street, and the only interaction between the two of them was within the theater group, because we needed girls to play some of the roles. So that seemed like a, <laughs> seemed like a good idea at the time. So I somehow or another got involved with the theater, and then stayed with that, actually. I did not go to, not go into science until rather late in life, in fact. So I worked in the theater for a number of years, 15, almost 20 years out of high school, apprenticed myself to various people. I never really went to college for it. In those days you didn't. You kind of worked as an apprentice and you worked your way up through this or that. And I eventually, my goal there was to, uh, I wanted to be a director. So I did a little bit of acting, but very little. But mostly stage managing, lighting design, that kind of thing. And then eventually directing, which I did for a number of years, both on the East Coast, mostly in rep companies, and on the West Coast in San Francisco, a little bit in Los Angeles. And then um, one day I decided to go back to school. <laughs> how, how old were you when for you were no, 30 years old? For no particular reason, I got involved with a show that seemed like it was going to run for a while. I'd done the lighting. I was asked to stay on and run the lighting. Um, so I did, and it looked like it was going to be a job for a while at night. I'd always had this interest, now not so much in astronomy, but I had developed an interest in animal behavior in particular. And... Um, in those days, one could go to San Francisco State University. The California State University system was one of the great marvels of the educational world. One could go there and be a full-time student for, I think it was $106 a semester. And that's not so long ago. I mean, even though I look like it should have been a long time ago, it was not so long ago. It was in 19... When did I start there? 1983. So, you know, 20-some-odd years ago, but even in today's dollars, how much would that be? So $106, one could go be a full-time student. I did not, in fact, go to be a full-time student. I went and took one class in animal communication from a professor named Hal Markowitz, who has remained to this day a good friend. And he was a wonderful mentor. It was maybe the most important thing that happened to me in my life the whole way through. Um, and I just had a wonderful time taking this class. I thought, well, this is really cool. I mean, I'd never been to college before. Even so, and I thought this is really cool somehow. This guy stands up there and tells you everything he knows about something. I thought, wow, what a nice idea. Who thought of this? I guess it was Aristotle, in fact, or so, someone like that. But, but that was the idea, you know. And I thought, well, that, this is really great. I, and I enjoyed the class, and I got to be sort of friendly with with uh, Hal, who was only like ten years older than me, in fact, maybe fifteen. And then he convinced me to take another class that he was teaching, also an animal behavior, which I did and I enjoyed. And then he somehow or another, I can't actually recollect to this day how he did it, kind of buttered me up and said, well, you know, you're, you're good at this. You should take a class. You should take a degree in biology, and you can do research with me. I think that was his idea, that I would do research with him. So I did, and I um, somehow or another started taking classes in biology, and that's what I did for the next three or four years. And I um, wound up with an undergraduate degree in biology, which, as we all now know, is completely worthless, or nearly so. <laughs> Terrible thing. Maybe that shouldn't be on the tape. <laughs> well, I mean, it's worthless in the sense that I think what it really sets you up, it's one of those degrees, one of those undergraduate degrees, like most science degrees are, that really sets you up to go on to do postgraduate work. So I was a little old for medical school and really wasn't all that interested in medicine or sick people or any of that kind of stuff. But I did like research, and so I thought, well, graduate school, I guess. So, so that really was a choice point for me, I suppose. I, um, 
I thought, well, I can either, I was, I continued to work in the theater all this time, although at a more minimal level, because I was, it was kind of odd. I was a full-time day student and worked at night. I mean, usually you hear a full-time, you know, <laughs> workers who take classes at night. I took classes in the day and worked at night. It was kind of an odd reversal. But, um, but I thought, well, I'll just, I could just go back and, you know, continue my work in the theater. I was reasonably successful. And, uh, and do that with my undergraduate degree in biology for whatever it had been fun and interesting. Or I could go to graduate school and try a new career and see what happened. I was 35 years old, so I thought, I don't know what the hell, I'll apply to graduate school and see what happens. So I applied to several graduate schools. I got into a couple. Most notably, I got into UC Berkeley. I think largely as the result of a clerical error, as I commonly say, but I didn't care. I said yes <laughs> immediately. And that's where I went and met another great professor, another real mentor for me, a fellow named Frank Werblin, who uh, worked in the visual system there in neuroscience, and, and I sort of hooked up with his lab. He kind of got me in, we got to be friends, and he got me into his lab, and that's where I did my graduate work. And uh, he was a, just a wonderful, tremendous mentor. And we also are very good friends. He was sitting on that sofa right there uh, last week, the, the last Wednesday, I guess, or Thursday. Anyway, he's in town, so he came over to visit mm -hmm. Um, and we stay in touch pretty regularly. So I finished a graduate degree there by my 40th birthday, which was my idea. I was hoping that, you know, somehow or another I could get through this career in time, that there could be a couple of years between tenure and, and uh, emeritus, <laughs> you know, to try to enjoy this a bit. So, so I did that, and then I wound up getting a very nice postdoctoral position at uh, Yale University, Yale Med School, with another great mentor, a fellow named Gordon Shepard, who really had a great deal, great influence on, on the rest of my life. I was a postdoc there, and then he pushed me, because I was older, I think at least partly, he pushed me very quickly into an assistant professor position. So he got me onto the faculty, and we got grants together and things like that. And that's really what kind of started my career, I suppose. And, uh, and I stayed there for about five years, all in all. And, um, Still very close with Gordon. Gordon may be the most because we work in the same field. Of course, he also works in the sense of smell and all that. So, so we continue to collaborate on some things and so forth. So I was, I, I must say, I was very lucky because I had three really exceptional mentors. And I often wonder, I must say, because you know, I hear these horror stories from graduate students or postdocs about these awful mentors. Quote that they work with these PIs, as we call them, principal investigators who run the labs that they work in, and you know, they steal this from them or treat them like shit or don't give them credit where they deserve it or, I don't know, hundreds of different things and you just hear these complaints. I mean, it's not that widespread, but you hear it a remarkable amount and I think to myself, I don't know, did I just get lucky? But I got lucky three times? I don't, I don't really know, but, but it, for me, I have to say it brought home to me the, the, the importance of the whole mentoring relationship, which we, you know, we don't teach anybody. I mean, I got taught how to be a scientist. I got taught a lot of facts as an undergraduate. I got taught how to do experiments as a graduate student. Um, I got taught sort of how to publish papers and get grants and do more experiments and think a little more deeply as a postdoc. But nobody ever really taught me how to run a laboratory, how to have students, how to have postdocs, how to mentor people in a way. I mean, I learned it. I think decently because I had three tremendous examples in my own life. But but even those people I just took by example. I mean, nobody ever said to me, well, this is how you do this. And I guess I don't really say it exactly to the students or postdocs in my laboratory because uh, I don't really know, <laughs> unfortunately. But it's a critical thing that we really somehow don't think about as much as we probably ought to, in my opinion. So that was one of the reasons I came to Columbia. Um, it was a sort of an off thing. There, there was a sort of a job open here, but not exactly. But I came down and gave a talk to the department, and they liked me, and I liked them, and we worked it out. And I, at Yale, I was at the medical school, which is a common place for biologists to be, even if you're not a doctor. There's a lot of research labs there, and I could have stayed at a medical. I could have stayed at Yale, for that matter, which was a very good place, or I could have taken jobs in a variety of medical schools if I wanted to go on to something else. But I always really wanted to return to a university situation. I went to a graduate school at Berkeley, which is a university, not a medical school situation. 
And the medical school was great. It's very intense. It's very focused. There's lots of people there to talk to and scientists and all sorts of things. And it's a great place to start a career, but it just was not, I couldn't see spending my life in a medical school. It was just too institute-like mm -hmm. somehow or another. And I liked undergraduates, and I liked teaching, and, um, and I somehow or another, it's going to sound terribly corny, you know, feel a certain responsibility to return what I was given. And I think I have a better chance of doing that on an undergraduate sort of campus, a university campus. Plus, I like hanging out with philosophers and classicists and language people. They think completely different than we in the sciences do. And it's interesting to be on committees with them, to tell you the truth. So, all right, so that was way too long an answer. Yeah, you answered, I think, you have 15 that questions. That was perfect. No, actually, you answered, I think, six of them. Oh, okay, that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> And uh, I guess that how you ended up at Columbia. Did you, I mean, when you applied to Columbia, were, was it the university was the city? I mean, was it, it was mainly the, the idea of being in a teaching position, being in the university? Yeah, well, uh, no, I mean, I, you know, this, this department, the biology department here, is dedicated to research. Mm -hmm. Virtually every member of this department runs a fairly sizable full-time laboratory operation with, I mean, it varies a lot. Some people like small labs, some people like big labs. Some people's research um, is better suited to a small lab and just a few students. Some people do the kind of research that really you need a kind of an army of people. We don't do so much of the army of people stuff here, but, but we have labs that have anywhere from two or three grad students and a postdoc to um, five, six, seven graduate students and five or six postdocs. I'm about in the middle. So at different times, my laboratory has been as big as 12 or 14 people it's been as small as just two or three when I first got it started. But, and now it's at about eight or nine, something like that. So we run laboratories here. I mean, this is a, the, the nice thing about Columbia, the great charm of this place, it seems to me, is that it's a major research institution that nonetheless finds a way to run as though it were a small liberal arts college. And that's really a remarkable combination of things that you don't often find. So, you know, most students are faced with this choice. I'll go to a small liberal arts college and get this well-rounded, wonderful education with a lot, of, uh, a lot of attention from professors and all that, but there's no professional level work going on there at the, in, in that sense. Or you go to some major research institution, you know, a University of Michigan or, the, you know, all these kinds of places. And, um, but there you lose the, you know, you're in 35,000 students or mm -hmm. something like that in big classrooms taught largely by graduate students often or things like that. And here I think you get really, um, you get both of those things. I, I have to say the humanities, I have to be honest, seem to be at the moment more successful about that than the sciences are. But I think we're coming along with that. I think Frontiers of Science is, if it's not a perfect course yet, the idea of the sciences adding to the core is a critical new development here. And it's just, it's, it's so important as a new way of thinking that whether or not the class works perfect, I know there's a lot of critique about the class, and it's a work in progress. But even if it doesn't work perfectly yet, it, it will eventually. And the idea of including it in the core is a sea change for science. Can, can you expand, I, I know you've, you've worked, you've been part of that getting frontiers of science. And can you expand on, I mean, where, where you see it going and how you see it improving? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I mean, it's very difficult. It's up for about a five-year review now, so it's, it's in its fifth year. I mean, I have to say I did not do, I don't want to take any credit for getting it started or anything like that. The, the heavy lifting was done primarily by Darcy Kelly and uh, David Halfand and a bit by Don Hood. I mean, people who had members of senior members, I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like they're ancient, but senior members of our faculty who have been at Columbia for many years and who knew precisely what the shortcomings were and what the, what the, what the real, um, uh, what the greatness of the university was built on and the fact that science wasn't fully participating in that. Um, and so that, so they had this, this real motivation to do that and, I, and, I, and a tremendous amount of credit goes to them for that because they pulled this course together largely out of nothing. I mean, they created it out of, you know, from zero. Um, I know they had long discussions uh, over it. I know some of them, I was in a couple of them or whatever, and what the form should take and what it shouldn't take. Um, and now I've taught in it for a, a few years, and now it's sort of up for review, and I'm actually on the, the Committee on Instruction, so one of the things we'll do is review it. And um, 
it, it's, a, it's not a trivial issue exactly how to work it. I mean, I think there are parts of it that work and there are parts of it that don't work. The parts of it that work seem to be the big lecture things where you get Columbia's world-renowned faculty or some members of it to come and put together these three or four, two, three, four lectures in their field but making their field accessible. And I think that alone, aside from what it may do for the students, which of course is still the primary thing, but that alone is, I think, an important thing because you actually enlist faculty who usually spend all their time buried in the lab and buried in their field and worried about the next paper and the next grant and all the rest of this and the competition. You get them to take a pause and think about how to put their work out there for a, a mostly lay audience, a group of smart kids but not trained not in any way prepared. And just the exercise of doing that, I think, is for many of us been very important. And will make people who have done it very useful when the university is called upon to have a spokesperson for this or that. I mean, we're in New York, we're in a media center, and that's what happens. Some scientific thing happens, and the press office here should get a call from some journalist or another, a writer, and say, who's, who would I, who's the expert at Columbia? And we'll have an expert as we build this group up uh, we'll have experts who know how to talk to the, to the public about what's going on and what they're doing, which I think is a critical issue. So in that sense, I think the course has been very successful, and I think it's been good for the students to see the kind of depth that, that research goes on in Columbia, you know, the, 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 way, it, um, the way it happens here and the, the depth of it and the, uh, the breadth of it and the people that are involved. Um, a little less successful, as I understand it, from the student reports are the sort of individual meetings, the classes, um, that meet once a week for two hours in smaller groups. Um, so the lectures are given to groups of 500 students. So there's so much you can do with that. And then the idea is that they meet and do activities or discussions or this or that based on the lectures themselves. And that seems to, at the moment, be the weak part of the course. It's weak on several accounts. I think it's also the most um, labor-intensive it's the most difficult for the, the course organizers to get organized, to enlist all the people to do it. It uses up a lot of faculty. And so it's the part of the course that uses the most resources, but is maybe, and therefore has to give out, give back the most, I think, but is probably not doing that at the moment. So I think that'll, we'll figure out how to fix that eventually. I don't know how, I don't know how, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> to tell you the truth. I mean, there are a lot of ideas around, I have some ideas, and. And the nice thing about Darcy, Kelly, and David Halfan, the real, now the co-court runners of the course, I guess Donovan a little bit too, is that, that they're very open to this. I mean, it's their baby and, you know, and I wouldn't blame them for being incredibly defensive, but in fact they're not. They're, they seem pretty open to it. So I think things will happen. But I think it's taken five years to figure out where, the, where you want to improve it without throwing the whole, the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and what, what are you working on right now? What, are, what kind of research? Ah, so my laboratory works on the sense of smell. I mean, we're a neuroscience laboratory, so our interest is the brain and how it works. I mean, that's the big question, of course. With no hope of answering that whatsoever, we've decided to hive off a smaller piece of it, and the smaller piece that I came away with was the nose, which, <laughs> yeah, you can see they're all over the place here. That's, the trouble with working on the nose is you get, <laughs> everybody thinks, oh, there's a great gift for Stu. <laughs> Let's get him a nose, as if I don't have any, you know. So this is the best of them. This is a paperweight. Um, and this is actually a model that was made for sculpting students. It's a model of uh, Michelangelo's David, of the nose from Michelangelo's David, because it's considered the most perfect version of it. And so art students are supposed to copy it. I have it as a paperweight, but that's all right. Anyway. <laughs> So, um, well, we use the nose, as most scientists do, as what we call a model system. So this is, a, this is sort of a critical idea in science that I think, I must say, the public and even many students um, don't really understand well. Uh, and it gives rise to, unfortunately, a lot of misunderstandings um, between the public and science. So the brain is just too hard to understand all by itself sit there and look at it and try to figure out how it works. It's just really difficult. So one looks for simpler systems along the idea that fundamental mechanisms in the brain are going to be found even at simpler levels, either in simpler organisms 
like worms or flies. You know, flies have a long history here at Columbia. The whole fruit fly genetics revolution um, started here in Skirmerhorn Hall at Columbia with Thomas Hunt Morgan's work, now just 100 years ago. And that was the beginning of genetics. I mean, and genetics is still a pretty big field, and it all started with fruit flies. And indeed, there are still thousands of people that work on fruit fly genetics, from which we continue to learn a great deal. Um, because it turns out that a lot of fruit fly genes, we actually have them too, you know. I mean, they have legs, they have heads, you know. I understand they have wings and we don't, but birds have wings, you know. And it takes genes to make all those things. And oddly enough, it takes many of the same genes. So anyway, so it's true when you work on simpler organisms to more complicated ones. And that we all believe because we all believe in evolution. And so there's a continuity in life, and therefore, even though we have a bigger brain, we have a hundred billion brain cells, each one of those brain cells is not so very different from the 302 brain cells that you find in a, in a little tiny um, nematode worm that many people work on. So they only have 300 and we have a hundred billion. Well, that's a big difference, I agree, and there's some things that you can't say, it's this way in the worm, it's this way in us. But the neurons themselves, those 300 neurons, are not so different from the 100 billion that we have, which have a lot more of them, and they connect up a lot more. So you can study simpler organisms to learn about more complicated organisms, or you can study subsystems of complicated organisms. So a mouse is pretty complicated, maybe not as complicated as a human, but a sense of smell probably is. And we think it's a good organ, it's a, it's a good sense of smell is a good subsystem of the brain to learn a lot about important issues in the brain. I can give you two or three examples if you want. So one of the things that we study in the sense of smell, of course, is what we would call molecular recognition. Now, this thing here is the best chemical detector on the face of the planet. There's no question about it. We, even we humans, who supposedly don't have such a great sense of smell, although we do have better than we think. The biggest problem with our sense of smell is that we walk on two legs. And all the good odors are down there on the ground. You know, they're heavy molecules. They sink down there. And so we just don't get our noses where the odors are. You know, other animals walk on four legs. Their noses are right on the ground. Or they put their noses where, they, where the odors are, which we also don't do. I'm very happy about also. But, but if we did put our nose right where the odors were, we'd smell them, believe me. Um, anyway, uh, but it is still a great detector of chemicals. And these chemicals that are odors... There are hundreds of thousands of them, and they're just small molecules that float around and given off by plants or foods or things like that or other, other organisms, fire, all kinds of things. Um, but they're all small molecules, and these small molecules don't look so different, to tell you the truth, biochemically, from molecules like dopamine or serotonin or acetylcholine, very important neurotransmitters and hormones and things like that. And it turns out that the receptors that we use, the proteins that we use to recognize molecules like dopamine and serotonin in our brains are very, very closely related to the receptors that our nose produces in order to smell the world out there. And so understanding molecular recognition can help us to understand how drugs can be produced, how we can design drugs, how, uh, how serotonin works with serotonin receptors because some odor like I don't know, amyl acetate that smells like bananas works a certain way with banana-type receptors, and the molecules don't look so different. So this whole idea of molecular recognition, what are the principles of how an organism, how a biological organism recognizes molecules, either internally or externally? Um, that's one area. Uh, olfactory neurons, the, the cells that make up the olfactory part of the brain, are unique among neurons in that they're renewable. You, get, you make new ones your whole life not true of any other neuron. No other neuronal population is replaced in an adult. Once you're born, you've got all the neurons you're ever going to get. In fact, you lose a lot of them during development, and then you lose a lot more as you get older, of course. And so, and due to injury or pathology or whatever, you may lose significant numbers of neurons. We have no way of replacing them. The olfactory system replaces them. And so if we could learn about how this happens, and we're studying this, one of the things we work on in my laboratory, so there are two important questions there. One is, how do you make new neurons? So there are stem cells. Stem cells is a big word now. That is used a lot, but in this case, there are, these are not the stem cells of embryonic stem cells, which can turn into anything. These are neural stem cells. The only thing they can become is neurons. 
And at the moment, the only thing they can become is olfactory neurons. But nonetheless, they sit there in the brain and continue to divide and make new olfactory neurons. So one thing we could know is how do they do that? And could we reprogram them to make a different kind of neuron, say a neuron that, that squirted out dopamine and could be used to replace the neurons we lose in Parkinson's disease, and that would perhaps cure Parkinson's disease. So how do they proliferate? How do they regenerate? How do they proliferate? And most importantly is how do they integrate into an already mature brain so that what smells to you like a rose today doesn't smell like a seeping pile of garbage to you the next day, right? I mean, you have to have a constant world. And yet, the olfactory system does this. It makes 30,000 new cells a day, which is a big chunk of cells, and yet those cells integrate into an existing, it was happening in you and me right now, and they integrate into an existing brain that's already learned things and done things and is set up and, um, and they figure out how to do this. And that's critical because it doesn't do any good to just figure out how to make neurons. Because you can't just make a big dish full of neurons and shove them into someone's brain and hope for the best. You know, they, they have to get into the right place. You can't just take a cell, stem cell, that wants to divide and become neurons and stick in someone's brain. You'll just get a tumor. You know, that won't do you any good. So you have to figure out how to make new cells and how to integrate them into an existing mature brain. And I think the olfactory system at least is one place in the brain where that goes on every day of our lives. So it's a great system for trying to figure that out. So those are just two of about half a dozen or more questions that I think we can get to with olfaction. Fascinating. My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Not to mention that it's all about food and wine and sex and things like that. So that's cool too, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, what, what are you teaching next semester? Uh, next semester, uh, most of the teaching I do is actually usually in the, um, in the fall semester mm -hmm. where I teach this big, dreadful cell and molecular neurobiology course. It really sounds very scary. I mean, I don't think it couldn't make it sound any more Old Testament if we wanted to, you know. <laughs> really, that doesn't scare them off. Nothing will. So, <laughs> so, um, so I just finished teaching that course. And it's a, it's a, not basic, it's a very sophisticated but introduction to the brain kind of course for an undergraduate, for a, typically a biology major or a neuroscience major. Um, and that's my main teaching responsibility here is, is that course, and I teach a couple of graduate seminars. But then over the last few years in the spring, I've been teaching a course that I sort of kind of slapped together myself in a way just because it's something I've been interested in, and it's a course called Ignorance. And it's particularly interesting, I have to say. Um, it, it comes out of this notion that, um, that the one mistake that we make, unavoidably, but we make this mistake in teaching science, especially to undergraduates, is that we just teach them a lot of facts. We fill them up with facts. And, and that's not trivial. It's not that facts aren't important. They are. And at some stage in your development as a scientist, it's important to get all these facts down, I mean, or some bunch of them. Um, and so that's unavoidable, but it's not what science is about. When I go to a meeting or hang out in the lab or, you know, meet up with a scientist pal at a bar or whatever, we never talk about what we know. We only talk about what we don't know. It's the only thing that's of any interest to a scientist is what they don't know. But I was worried that we weren't giving our students any sense of that at all. That they just thought science was some big old fact book. And if you just could memorize it, that would be fine. Excuse me, sure, one, no just one second. Hi, can I call you back in just about five or ten minutes? Okay, right. Um, so I thought, well, maybe it'd be interesting to try, and I sort of worked it into my own course a little bit. I would, my last lecture, I would talk about, okay, now fill you up with all these facts about cell and molecular neuroscience. It may seem like we know everything. It's a big, thick textbook, but look, really, I'm just going to throw out dozens of questions and tell you we don't know any of these things. You know, here's all the stuff we have no idea about, um, and it's a lot more than what we know. And that's important because that means there's work for you, for you out there. <laughs> there's a future in this, you know. So then I started. Then I thought, well, maybe we could expand this course even. Maybe expand this idea into a course. And so the course basically is. I only teach it in the spring, and its only limitation is that it's only, <clears throat> excuse me, it's only for seniors. I do that for two reasons. One is it's a sort of a capstone kind of a quality, and the other major reason is that I don't really want to deal with grades. And 
for the most part, seniors, you know, you can't affect your GPA by very much one way or the other with one course, so it doesn't matter what grade they really get. And by their last semester, most of them are already in graduate school or medical school or law school or business, wherever it is they're going, you know, from here. They're, they've already got that sort of set up. And so the grades just don't matter as much, and so I don't have to worry about the grade thing. It's just not, not for me. So it's typically a small course, although I don't over-limit it, but it's somewhere between 30 and 50 students. And we, we meet once a week um, from 6 to 8 p.m., typically on Wednesday nights. And I invite most of the courses. We meet once a week, so it's about 13 or 14 meetings per semester. And for about eight of them, eight or nine of them, I invite members of the faculty, the science faculty from various departments, to come in one at a time and spend two hours with the students and tell them all about what they don't know. And just talk to them about what it is they don't know, what they want to know, why they're working on this and not that, how they came to this question, why this is a critical question, why it's more important than that one, what will happen if we don't know this, what will happen if we do know it, et cetera, et cetera, all those sorts of things. And so it's great. It's always a little bit funny. You know, I call people up on the phone. I say, hi, so-and-so. Uh, listen, I'm teaching this course on ignorance, and I think you'd be great, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's always a tricky sort of an invitation. But, but the great thing is the faculty here all realize immediately that that's absolutely right. Of course, I know that that's what I really could talk, you know. And usually that's what I get, ah, finally, <laughs> something, I can, something I can talk about intelligently. So, um, and that's what they do. No PowerPoints, no, you know, very little preparation. Just come in and let's discuss what you don't know. And it's been great. So I have chemists, physicists, mathematicians, um, biologists, neurobiologists, microbiologists, climate people, um, all engineers, all kinds of, have come in over. This will be the fourth year. And I think it's been very successful. The students seem to like it a great deal. They get into it. And, um, and it's fascinating, and I learn a lot about what the other faculty around here are doing. And it's very interesting because you take a, so, so mathematics was always the, you know, the tricky one, I thought. Am I going to be able to get math done here? Are they going to be able to say anything that anybody can understand to anybody but ten other people in the world? You know, that's, and they think that way. Most mathematicians, you go to them and they say, oh, I, I, I don't know, nobody understands what I say. There's only ten colleagues I have that understand but it turns out that they, they do do a good job. So I've tried a couple, and they're pretty good at it, oddly enough. Um, in fact, they're dying for somebody to understand <laughs> what it is they do. They're sick of talking to the same ten people, you know, and, and that's true of a lot of science. We've gotten very balkanized in science and overly specialized. The nice thing about talking about what you don't know is you tend not to use a lot of jargon, and you tend not to make a lot of assumptions about what's in people's heads already, like you do, say, with colleagues or something when you, you know. So, so that's the nice thing about it is it, it makes it much more accessible to students. So many of the students aren't science majors. I don't make that a requirement. There's no science prerequisite for the course. I'd say about a third of the students are either not science majors or they're science majors and some humanities maybe they double major in their humanities too. So I have a lot of people from classics, literature, religion, philosophy, et cetera, et cetera, in there as well. It's been very interesting. It's been a great course, actually. My favorite thing to do here. All right, let's get on to a couple okay. of lighter questions. Okay. We <laughs> um, oh, where, where do you live? In the Columbia ghetto here, Columbia Housing. So I have an apartment on Riverside Drive, mm -hmm. which the university is nice enough to rent to me at a reasonable rate. I think that's a great idea, though, not to get off on another long tangent here, but you know, the housing situation of Columbia is one of its key resources, I believe. And I, I sometimes think it doesn't treat it that way. I mean, I, I know everybody thinks it's important because we all clamor over it and all that. But the difference between Columbia here in, quote, Morningside Heights, which is we all know is really Harlem, and Yale University in New Haven, which is also a very depressed kind of an area, is just night and day. And Yale never made that kind of investment in the community. They did not buy property in the community. They do not induce people to live in New Haven. And indeed, everybody lives in the suburbs. And it's pitiful because here's this great university in a town that should be able to add to its economy and add to the, to the quality of life of all the residents there by having the university sort of enmeshed in the community. And it's not. I mean, Yale University is surrounded by parking lots. 
which the faculty pull into from the suburbs in the morning, and they pull out at night, you know. And the students stay in these colleges, these residential colleges, which are very inward looking. They all have courtyards, and that's what they do. This is so much more lively and so much more interesting. I mean, you have, you have a kind of like a little university town in the middle of Manhattan here, you know. And it's kept this neighborhood vibrant. It's why I, I frankly, I'm a supporter of Manhattanville. I actually do, I'm a supporter of Manhattanville for weird reasons. Unlike President Bollinger, who feels that Manhattanville is a solution to a space problem, I don't really feel we have a space problem in Columbia. I really like being cramped mm -hmm. together. I mean, that's a New York thing, maybe, or whatever, but I like the idea of being cheek by jowl and not having, you know, having so little space that we have to think carefully about what we do with it and make collaborations with each other to use our space better and things like that. So I'm all for that. What I like about Manhattanville is that I think it'll be a great improvement to that neighborhood up there, and it needs it, you know, and I think it will make, and I think it'll be a gateway into Harlem, and it'll integrate Columbia into the Harlem neighborhood and make it more vibrant. And that will, I think, just from an urban planning point of view, universities, in my opinion, make good neighbors. Not everybody thinks Sorry. that. Sorry, did you see your glasses? Where'd you find them? In the, uh, the facts in this room, you have no, I've been so looking for those for three weeks. I actually went and bought a new pair. Ah, <laughs> finally. Yours. Good, now I have a spare pair. Do you ask our Thanks. drivers to Thanks. cover yours? Yeah, well, there's the old bumbling professor thing, and <laughs> you've okay, got you it. Put it everywhere. Thank so you very much. You. And now you've got it on film, too. <laughs> well, there you go, it's typical. Um, so, um, so I think the whole neighborhood thing here is very important, and the fact that we that the faculty live here, staff live here, students live here, and, and, and it becomes a vibrant neighborhood. So, and I like living in the city anyway. I mean, that's part of the great attraction, you know. So, um, you mentioned uh, you know you got into uh, you got into biology through animal behavior. Do you have any pets? Well, uh, yes, did. I'm afraid. Uh, so I sorry. How, uh, that's a pet here. <laughs> have one. Uh, have just have a, have, a, have one cat now. But uh, had a uh, big old Newfoundland until about a year ago. He passed away a year ago, and we have not um, quote replaced him. Of course, he's irreplaceable. But but uh, my daughter, who just turned eighteen, is now a college student here. I'm happy to say. So she moved out of the house, and that has made it. I think it's given us thoughts about whether to get a pet or not. Because my wife, who works with animals, she's at Hunter College, a professor at Hunter, and actually does work in animal behavior. Um, which I don't do so much anymore, but she works with big animals like dolphins and elephants and things like that. And she really loves to have dogs and cats and things around. So, But we've thought twice about a dog just because neither of us are really around as much. And without a kid there who's around some of the time to pay attention to the dog, I don't think a dog gets enough attention, you know. So we refrain from that. But at one time we had a dog, two cats, hamster, <laughs> all together, all at once. Is, is your mess. daughter your only child? Yes. Okay. And is she yeah. in the college? Or She's in the college. That's congratulations. Yeah, just started. That's exciting. Yeah, she, yeah, it's great. It's great. And she loves it, which is very nice because, you know, as a faculty member, you tend to sit on a lot of committees that bitch and moan and whine about how awful things are and how we're going to fix them and why we don't have enough resources for this and that. And we're always complaining to somebody as part of the deal here, apparently, you know. And so you can get a very warped view of the university. So it's, it's really quite a pleasure to have her here because I talk to her at least once a week or so with each other. And she just is having the time of her life here. She thinks it's, it's awesome. the greatest place on the planet. And I'm thinking, well, that, that's good. Because I had no idea, you know. I was beginning to think, this is a dump here. We're running some kind of, I don't know what. But it's not the case. It's, it seems to be a pretty good place for the students, which is very important. Um, how do you recharge? Um, heavy drinking, <laughs> um, <laughs> stuff like that. Well, so it's a good question. I uh, <laughs> I don't know. That, that's not entirely. <laughs> maybe I should say that. I I do like. I do actually like to um, hang out in coffee shops or bars, and um, have friends who are not in the sciences, and even some who are not in academia but who are, I still know some actors and singers and people like that, and I think it's useful to hang out with them because I kind of, you know. So I hang out just by being social. I mean, I recharge by being social. That, that's good enough for me. I'm happy with that. Yeah. 
I mean, we go up to the country. We have this nice place in the country. We go up there for a couple of days. But, you know, the, uh, that only recharges me in the sense that after about two days in the country, I get <laughs> patient and I have to come back and go to work again. And I get a little buzz here from the city, you know. Um, do, you have, do you have a favorite spot in New York City? Oh, a favorite spot in New York City. Wow, that's a good question. I don't know. I like a lot of it. I'm a walker, so I like to walk. It's a great town to walk in, of course. So, I mean, I often, I try to go out for lunch every day. You know, I, I, I make sure that the lab has no coffee machines in it, no microwaves, no refrigerators, because I think it's actually important, not only for me, but for the students to get out as well, to not get into that habit of eating three meals a day, you know, in the hallway here and going right back to an experiment. I think they should get out now and again for a cup of coffee or for a bite to eat. So I try and get out a couple days a week, at least for lunch, and take a long walk, either get on the subway and go somewhere else almost randomly, mm -hmm. and then have a bite to eat and walk, you know, a mile or two back or a mile or two and get back on the subway. So I don't know about a favorite place in New York. I'm trying to think of a, I mean, I really love the city, so I don't, I can't think of a particular. Okay. <laughs> um, do, you, uh, do, you still, do you still go to the theater? Do you have a favorite play that you've seen recently? Yeah, I, wait, I do still go to the theater. I, um, I, I go to other things more than the theater. I tend to go to the symphony more than the theater. I, I tend to go to the opera even more than the theater. But I do go to the theater occasionally. Um, in fact, I just went to three pieces. I guess you'd call them sort of theater pieces. New Wave, they call this, I guess, or avant-garde pieces. And I went to them as an emissary of Science Magazine who asked me to write a review on them. And so, in fact, I just finished the galleys, the proofs of this review, which should come out next week. So, and, and I went to three things that were really spectacular, I have to say, so I was lucky that way. I went to um, um, Richard Foreman's new piece called Idiot Savant, so Richard Foreman's this very avant-garde director who's been around for 40 years, it's hard to believe, because I remember when he sort of first started, I can't imagine that, but, but he's been doing kind of wacko, really, you know, minimal, I wouldn't call it minimalist, but what I call this theater, I don't know what to call it. He runs a company called the Ontological Hysterical Theater, so that'll tell you what it is. Anyway, he did a piece called Idiot Savant, which maybe had a little bit of a science-y thing about it or something. Not really much, but it was a very interesting with Willem Dafoe in the, in the so-called title role, I guess. That's not much of a title role, but um, that was quite intriguing. That was at the public theater. And then I saw two pieces at BAM, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, that were part of this New Wave Festival. One was a circus called... In and it's called Circus Circor, but the piece they did was called Inside Out. The idea being they took the inside of the body and brought it out and, uh, and made a circus event out of it. It's very hard to explain in a short way, but it was very intriguing. A little bit of a Cirque du Soleil kind of thing, but, but a bit more intellectual as well, but no less fun. And then finally, the best piece I've seen in a while, I guess, was a, was a concert performance, but nonetheless still spectacular, of uh, Philip Glass's opera called Kepler, which is about the life and works of Kepler. Sorry, we're out. No, we're done. Done. Anyway, that was really good. That was also at BAM. Um, what great theater pieces have I seen lately? I did go to something that I really liked, and I can't think of what it was. It's really awful. I went to see God of Carnage, and I actually didn't like it that much. I've had a few people say that they didn't like that. I just think it's wildly overrated. It's not bad, but it's wildly overrated. It's the kind of piece that in the hands of a, of a Harold Pinter or somebody like that would really have been spectacular, but I wasn't in the hands of a Harold Pinter. It was a little bit, somehow or another, you know, it wasn't quite Neil Simon, and it wasn't quite Harold Pinter. It was in the middle of those two things, and I didn't think it really did anything much. So, but that was me. Apparently it's playing <laughs> the standing room only crowd, so what can I tell you? There was another theater piece I saw recently, and it's just terrible that I can't remember what it was. Um, anyway, uh, yes. A couple more. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, here's a tough one. What's your favorite food? Oh, my favorite food. Wow. <laughs> I don't know. I have a lot of them. Um, There's someone who studies the nose. I yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, you know, <laughs> my favorite food. Well, I mean, you know, living in New York, there's so many, the Asian cuisine thing has gotten so, I mean, it so permeates everything that I guess in many ways I live, I think I eat as much Chinese food as they eat in China, I think. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> um, 
I have a good friend who happens to be an Italian chef who makes the best lasagna in the world, though. So as a single dish, I might have to put his lasagna at the very, very top of the list. But otherwise, I'm, a, I'm pretty much an omnivore, I have to say. I mean, I'll, I'll eat almost, almost anything. Um, I mean, I don't like <laughs> pulsating, crawling things or stuff like that so much. I like it dead. But, <laughs> but otherwise, uh, I'm pretty omnivorous that way. Um, all right. Uh, two more questions, I think. Okay. Um, uh, what's the last book you read for pleasure that you really enjoyed? Okay, the last book I read for pleasure that I really enjoyed. All right, I read a book called... So believe it or not, I'm, I've been reading books lately on this... Um, I got a Kindle a while ago. Oh, nice. Okay. And uh, I actually don't like the Kindle very much. But it turns out there's an app for the iPhone mm -hmm. for the Kindle. And I love reading on this thing. Isn't that weird? I actually, I don't mind it either. I, I, I read the Times on it now. and You know, it's a bright screen. Mm -hmm. It's really crisp and clear. And, and scrolling um, is just a natural motion. Scrolling is very natural. And you know what's very nice about it also is because of the, because of the size of it, I tend to read much faster because I read down a column mm -hmm. instead of, you know, all the way across the, you know, the way they tell you to chunk when you read. But mm -hmm. Nobody can ever really do that except a few <laughs> savant types. But this I feel I can actually kind of go down a page. So I'm just going to go look here for a minute. Um, I'm going to have to do one thing. At um, the name, so I get the name of the book exactly right. All right, hold on, hold on. That's what I have to do. Um, the book I read was... History book of all things. This is going to drive me crazy that I can't remember. Oh, the Vertigo Years. It was called by Philip Blom, B L O M. It's about the time. It's a history book about the time period between around 1900 and 1915, and it's. I mean, it's a, it's a different time than now, but there's certain similarities were fascinating. I have to say, especially in science, but not entirely. I mean, it was the age of electricity and dynamism, dynamos, and all these newfangled cars and things like that, airplanes to some extent, and, and radio and so forth. And, and the world, I mean, people complained about how fast the world was suddenly moving and who could keep up with it all and all the rest of that, and yet it was a very exciting time. Of course, it led some good places and some bad places, but it was very fascinating to see, I mean, because you couldn't help but think about our days now through this it's a beautifully written book, beautifully written book. So I enjoyed that immensely. And that was, I just sort of picked that up for, I read a review of it, sounded interesting. Thought I'd read that. Okay. And um, uh, what on your resume are you most proud of? That is, Ooh, and that's geez. a tough one, I know. My resume am I most proud of? <laughs> well, I'd like to say, but it's still a work in progress, um, really the list of uh, graduate students that have graduated from my laboratory. Because uh, mostly I could say this paper or that paper or this finding or that finding, but it was generally their finding. And in the end, I'll only be here for, you know, a pitifully short number of years, but they'll be here a lot more years and they'll have students and one hopes it goes on that way. So for me, really, the greatest pleasure is, is sort of watching this list of graduate students and postdocs kind of grow over the years and realize how many people have really kind of come through and gone on and done and are doing now great things and become colleagues. Seems to me that's our job here. Our job here is to grow colleagues, you know. Great that's, sentiment. <laughs> yeah. So if you do that and you do that well, then you have good colleagues and you've done your job and everything is right. Great. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Well, that was fun. I, I really actually. appreciate that. Yeah.